Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Laura Vaselli. I'm the Manager of Research and Foresight here at eCampus Ontario, and I will be the moderator for today's session. I am joining today from Toronto, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek Nations, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I am a guest and a settler on this land. I pair my land acknowledgement today with action, actions that we can take toward reconciliation and decolonization. This may look differently to every attendee, but I ask today that we create a space built on curiosity and respect. To that end, I encourage participants of this session to actively engage with our presenters by using the chat to submit questions and comments, which we will discuss at the end. Today's presentation titled Holistic Approach to Micro-Credentials and Upholding Indigenous Lifelong Learning includes representatives from the Indigenous Institutes Consortium and their member institutes, Six Nations Polytechnic and Ashkipa Machawin, the Wenjack Education Institute. Please join me in welcoming our presenters. We have Wendy Johnson, Executive Director, and Jake Jamison, Executive Assistant from the Indigenous Institutes Consortium. From Six Nations Polytechnic, we have Rebecca Jamison, President and CEO, and Sam Gray, Educational Consultant. We also have Ashley Pressinger, Strategic Initiatives Coordinator from Ashki Pamachowin, the Wenjack Education Institute. Today, they will provide a learner and practitioner perspective and an overview of the Indigenous Institutes Consortium's unique approach to, to strategic collaboration. I will now pass it to them. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here with you and to be sharing this information with everyone who's joined us today. Just a little bit about the Indigenous Institutes Consortium. Our members are Indigenous Institutes that were established by mandates of their First Nations, um, beginning in the early 1980s to meet the needs of training and post-secondary education in the First Nations um, after many, many decades of colonized education. So our approach to education is quite unique because we have the whole recovery and revitalization of languages and culture to deal with, as well as the skills and education development to participate in the economy. So we very much uh, appreciate working together. We do work together as a collaborative. We have worked since, as I said, the early 1900s to 1990s to as a, as a consortium to you know, to secure the resources we needed to be able to fulfill our missions and to promote our recognition. And by working together for all of those years in 2017, um, we were really pleased to be part of an historic um, achievement with the passage of the Ontario's Indigenous Institutes Act. Go to the next slide, please, Jake. With that passage of that legislation, the Indigenous Institutes in Ontario became the third pillar in post-secondary education in Ontario. And we were really pleased to be able to uh, join with eCampus in the development of micro-credentials when doing them from our unique perspective and bringing our unique ways of knowing and being to that new platform of learning that's going to expand opportunities for our learners. If you were with us to begin with today, uh, Rowan, one of our students, um, opened the forum and we are very uh, proud of him and we're happy to share that we have many young people um, participating in their language and their culture now because we were able to participate in the post-secondary landscape and with micro-credentials we'll be able to do even more so we're really pleased that you're with us and we really appreciate the cooperation and collaboration that we've experienced with eCampus. Thank you. Over to you Wendy. And uh, on to the next slide, Jake. So this is just taking you a little bit further in understanding who our member institutes are with the Indigenous Institutes Consortium. We have seven members and they consist of the Anishinaabek Education Institute and they are manda mandated by 39 First Nations in Ontario. Yohio Akwesasne Education and Training Institute mandated by the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne. Kenjigaywantay, and they're mandated by seven First Nations. Ongohongoy Skills and Trades Training Center, mandated by Six Nations of the Grand River. Ashki Pamajiowen, the Wenjak Education Institute, mandated by 49 First Nations of the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. 
Shingwa Kinumagaming uh, <laughs> are mandated by two First Nations. And we have Six Nations Polytechnic, who is also mandated by the Six Nations of Grand River. And you see the map on the right hand side that gives you an indication of where they are located all across Ontario. Um, the mandating First Nations total 99 in total of the 133 in Ontario. Next. So this is a snapshot of, of how we work as the consortium and how we work up with our members. The foundation of, of our function is looking at the continuum of, of learning, lifelong learning through education, uh, very much built on a holistic model, how everything is connected together. So when we look at strategic co collaboration, um, where we come from within our culture and our tradition and our history, um, you know, if we're single, we're weaker, but if we work together in a bundle, we're much stronger. And that really is the philosophy uh, behind the consortium. When we look to the future focus in terms of growth capacity and recognition, we actually have seven spokes on a wheel, if you will, that look at partnership, relationships, resource sharing, collaboration, anti-racism, decolonization, and restoring and revitalizing wellness. And that's really what we try to work through and, and meeting those, those pieces. So we look at current developments and you'll hear um, after this from Six Nations Polytechnic and from Oshki Pemaji Owen, two of our members of how we, how we actually um, implement collaboration. And because we're about working together, that's how we went forward with this presentation to showcase that collaboration and those efforts by sharing this platform and, and talking with you. And I think it's really important to build on what the minister said this morning. Uh, minister Dunlop was very eloquent when she talked about the ability to pivot and others talked about just the um, how much work was put into working with COVID, making sure that learners had success and what institutes in Ontario went through. But I, I have to share that the Indigenous Institutes pivoted exceptionally well. Um, the needs of Indigenous learners are so strong and so intense, and they know what needs to happen, what needs to be created and implement to meet the needs of Indigenous learners in Ontario. And I mean, we can think of it as they may be smaller institutes, but they are mighty. And with that, the importance of micro credentials that really speaks to the strength of what that means in First Nations communities through the member institutes. It's that having the Indigenous ways of knowing and being embedded in everything they do and what they create. And I think we've, we've talked about it before that micro credentialing is not new. And we've heard that in, in the opening speakers, but they've been the institutes have been doing that work for a long time under other names, whether it be transition programming or prep program or, or other mechanisms, but label something else. So, so they have been doing it a long time and really have the foundational base for that. And lastly, in you know, IIC's role is really that recognition of the institutes and what they are doing in the success that they have and their expertise in indigenous learning in that lifelong learning realm. So at the bottom of the screen, you see micro-credentials equals, and it's a tree, which signifies growth. And within our culture and our history, the white pine is very, very prominent um, in our culture, and it's that growth. And you add that growth with, with more than one tree, and you get capacity. And that's really what the micro-credential platform is, is helping us do in Indigenous learning. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, and uh, good afternoon to everyone joining us here today. In discussing the development process for our virtual learning strategy projects, I wanted to first stress the substantively collaborative nature of this work, from the very seed of the ideas we pitched through to the submission of our finished micro-credentials to the eCampus Ontario Library. We began last winter with an analysis of the ECO call, uh, a deep dive sectoral scan, a very deep dive, and strategizing around what this funding opportunity meant for Indigenous institutes in particular, for Indigenous institute pedagogies and for their teaching and learning communities. These preparatory activities led to a briefing note 
circulated among the IIC member institutions and discussed at two governance circle meetings. Of the seven possible projects outlined in that briefing note, two were selected for their potential to address shared priorities, to meet institutional and community needs, to build capacity and relationships, and to catalyze promising spin-off initiatives. The briefing note additionally proposed and the governance circle discussed best practices for collaborative undertakings of this scale that included all of the member IIs working together, including which member institution would assume the lead and what the composition of the core project team would be. Project applications were drafted and reviewed by the Indigenous Institutes. These were submitted to eCampus Ontario after feedback from all seven participating partners was incorporated. Both of those applications were successful. Recruitment for project team positions was initiated with a call sent out through the consortium, inviting applications for subject matter experts, for a research assistant, and for an e-learning technologist, with overall leadership and project management assigned to strategic initiatives at Six Nations Polytechnic. And we ended up with a fantastic mixed team of Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and settler colonial members, all of whom were post-secondary instructors with a strong background in Indigenous education. Once our team got to work, Periodic updates were provided to IIC members through presentations to the governance circle and associated information sessions, including one that we did on open educational resources for the IIs and a micro-credentials 101 workshop. Later on in the development process, we reached out uh, through the IIC again to find individuals interested in participating as learners in our course pilots or as experts on our special project quality assurance committee. Next slide, Jake. The two IIC project applications that were funded through BLS Round 1 were HyFlex Design in Indigenous Teaching and Learning and Indigenous e-learning assessment strategies. And here you can see a sample of the learning outcomes from each micro-credential. Um, we, we started at the foundation. We started with the pedagogical and the ontological and epistemological things. And we moved outward through practical applications. We wanted to make this a mix of um, truly introspective and reflective engagement in what it means for Indigenous pedagogies to be mobilized online and tools that you can bring to your classroom. Next slide, Jake. Of those original seven seed ideas, these two were selected because they led the pack on key criteria, including closing the e-learning gap between the three pillars, disrupting historical inequities, and paving the way for additional downstream innovations in Indigenous community-based post-secondary education. Uh, for supporting Indigenous learners and building digital fluency, which is the stream we applied to under the BLS, and positioning the IIs as vital contributors in Ontario's virtual learning landscape. Because in short, nobody can develop and deliver this programming the way the Indigenous Institutes can. For the very same reason though, it's important to underscore that these projects presented special challenges because they were unique engagements in Indigenous e-learning. This is an emerging field of inquiry and publication. So by definition, there is not a lot of pre-existing data to work with. Since we could not build these deliverables by engaging with the literature, we were always looking at intensive research initiatives using decolonizing methodologies to explore applied Indigenous epistemologies and pedagogies through original Indigenous community-based research. And a second leg of inquiry was undertaken later in the process by engaging teachers and learners from Indigenous communities in the full course pilots that we ran in the fall. Next slide, Jake. Uh, in closing out my section, I wanted to uh, underscore that we were fully up to the challenges of this work by virtue of the skills and the experiences that the Indigenous Institutes hold individually and collectively. We're talking about a proven track record of developing and delivering culturally grounded programming that serves a range of learners and satisfies an array of standards of excellence, internal and external, bringing together Indigenous communities industry actors and education and training institutions and continuously innovating across delivery modalities and learning environments. And these projects were incredibly rewarding for us to undertake and we look forward to their continued contribution to our collective teaching and learning community across all of the Indigenous Institute partners. Uh, thank you and over to Ashley. Hi everyone, um, I can't turn my video on, so, um, oh, there we go. 
I have permission again. Thank you. Um, so if we, um, I just want to give a little bit of background about Oshki Wenjack and sort of how we fit into the, the landscape of micro credentials. Um, so my name is Ashley. I work as the strategic initiative coordinator at Oshki. Uh, my role is to help um, sort of move the organization forward as we start to um, look at accreditation and, and sort of uh, our, our long-term goal as an institution. Um, we, uh, we look to meet the needs of our 49 communities. Of those 49 Anishinaabe Aski Nation communities, 34 are remote. Um, by remote, I mean um, by air or by winter roads. So um, only road access is in the winter and only some of those have that access. There are communities that are by air only. Um, and of the air communities, some of those you have to request access to. You can't simply book a ticket and, and fly into them. So um, this presents with a very unique set of needs. Um, so micro-credentials sort of serves uh, a purpose for us, which is why as an institution, we, we are um, very much engaged with the process of creating micro-credentials. Um, so when the opportunity came um, up with SMP to be involved as a learner in these micro-credentials that were created through this project through eCampus, um, we, um, we sort of jumped at the opportunity. So I engaged in the decolonization of Indigenous e-learning um, and found that, uh, you know, there were some great benefits to it. Um, the content was extremely specific, which is something that tends to happen with micro-credentials. There's an opportunity for the content to be um, honed in or, or created to meet the very specific needs of what the learners are looking for. Um, there was an opportunity to interact with peers from your sector. So I was interacting with other teachers, other Indigenous Institute leaders, people who um, have direct experience working with the learners that I work with, which was an excellent opportunity for learning, for a, a real collaboration and community. Um, and it allowed for collaboration outside of the classroom or outside of the e-learning experience um, between institutions. So from that, OSHKI and SMP have been able to partner on another group of micro-credentials that we've uh, submitted to eCampus. So an, an opportunity to really start to move forward as partner organizations, which as IIC does, um, IIC encourages that. And that's something that the IIC sort of uh, branches or, or creates opportunities for. So um, this project has lended itself, not just to creating a learning environment or a learning opportunity, but so much more for the Indigenous Institutes. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so then uh, shifting over to the learner perspective in terms of our OSHKI learners for MCs, what does this then, what did that experience then uh, create in terms of us being the delivery agents or the MC creators? So we were able to take away from that experience with SNP a lot of um, ways to create our own MCs. One thing that is great about IIs delivering MCs is again that we can create specific curriculum that um, that is specific or that is um, developed to meet the specific needs of community. So like I said, our communities of NAN, 34 of them are remote. Their needs, their ga gaps in service, their gaps in workplace are so unique and very different to that, uh, to the gaps in service or gaps in work that uh, the rest of Ontario identifies. So we are able to create MCs that meet the specific needs of community. Other institutions maybe can't necessarily do that. The mainstream institutions have a larger context or a larger group um, of people that they have to satisfy. The IIs can meet that specific need of communities. Um, we can also, uh, also create opportunities for Indigenous knowledge to really be uh, emphasized and for curriculum to be developed around Indigenous ways of knowing, around um, language, around um, traditions and cultures in a way that other institutions maybe don't have the same opportunity to do. 
Um, so that's one way that we've been able to sort of develop our MCs. We are creating MCs that capture that indigenous, traditional indigenous ways of knowing. We're creating an indigenous midwifery program, indigenous paramedicine program, all of these that go back to traditional ways of knowing, being, and really hone in on um, indigenous practices versus Western practices. Um, addressing the gaps in service and also maintaining an identity, an indigenous identity in our curriculum. So embedding knowledge in absolutely every way that we can, um, which is again, something that IIs can do that is different than mainstream sector. So this is really why um, if you're looking to create or, or take MCs that are, are around indigenous type knowledge, it's important to look to the IIs for that type of training. Um, and I think that's it, thanks. Thank you for that. So just uh, Nyawa Miigwech, thank you uh, for allowing us the opportunity to speak with you. This is just a contact us um, slide. So if you wanna contact uh, the IIC, Oshki or Six Nations Polytech, um, you can take a quick snapshot. And this is sort of who we are, my choice, my path, Indigenous learners, and this is what it's all about. So, Nyawa Goa. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, I will now, of course, invite our attendees to submit their questions. We have a few coming in. I've gotten a few myself. Um, so without further ado, I will pose the first question to the group. Uh, so this question says, I appreciate the micro-credential equation uh, represented by white pine. What is the most important thing Indigenous institutes need to develop their capacity to support micro-credentials? And I will open up to anyone who wants to answer it. I know. Could you just oh, repeat? Sorry, go ahead, Rebecca. Go I'm ahead. just going to ask her to repeat it again. Yeah, of course. The question is, what is the most important thing Indigenous institutes need to develop their capacity to support micro-credentials? Go ahead, Ashley. Um, I know for Oshki, we're a small institution. One of the struggles is to be able to um, bring in the people, the, the knowledge keepers, to bring in the people that are the, the content or the, the curriculum developers um, and the people that really are knowledgeable in the subject areas to be able to create that curriculum and create that content. Um, funding is very important. So be able, being able to access that funding to allow the right people to come in to build that program is an area that has been uh, difficult. So it's really trying to chase the funding to allow that to develop um, and to allow the programs to exist holistically within the Indigenous paradigm but also in a way that meets the funders requirements. So it's, it's really a struggle between the two worlds um, that where IIs are often, often trying to battle between. Well said, absolutely. Rebecca, did you want to add anything? Just I'll, just, uh, I'll just add to the, to the matter of capacity. Um, Indigenous institutes by and large historically have not had core funding, so we don't have full-time staff on hand. So everything is contract-based. So that's a huge capacity challenge for us. So, yeah, but we're, we, we're pretty resourceful. <laughs> well, it, it made me think, Sam, if I could ask you, you touched on that in your piece of the presentation, how you took the time to find the staffing for those two micro-credentials and, and any reflection from that experience that you think the attendees could take away with when we talk about capacity. Yeah, I think it, not to put too fine a point on it, but what, what we need is, is exactly the kind of support that we had in the VLS. So we had an appreciation from eCampus Ontario that developing Indigenous curriculum is inherently research-based. It involves the entire teaching and learning community, and it is best undertaken in a collaborative way, and collaboration takes time. If we want to bring those voices to the table, if we want to have all of those overlapping strengths brought together, um, we need the, the space to do it. It doesn't just mean the funding, although the funding was obviously critical. It means the time. It means that we had a year to develop these materials and we were able to do it in a good way um, uh, with, with good intentions and, and we were able to operationalize really good culturally grounded processes to do so. Wonderfully said, absolutely. 
I have, oh, we have lots of activity. So we, I'm gonna get to the next question if that's okay. Um, uh, Robert says, thank you for a great presentation. I am interested to learn more about how you are, quote, maintaining indigenous identity and context in, as mentioned, and what we can learn about supporting this. And I think actually that was a point on one of your slides, but you don't have to answer. I won't put you on the spot. Uh, so one thing that Ashki does is we work very closely with communities. So all curriculum goes through a consultation period with our community members. So whether we're delivering a program specifically designed by a community, so a community might come to us and say, we need, we're short on um, Indigenous classroom teachers. We need, so we'll create a program that specifically meets the needs of that community. Or if we're creating just a general community, all of our programs through, go through consultation with community. So it, I might write a proposal, but it's the community or the, the members that are sort of um, representing the community that ultimately decide how that proposal is framed, the outcome of that proposal. Um, so it's, it's consultation. It's um, when we have an opportunity to bring in curriculum developers, it's members from our community that are doing the curriculum. Um, we hold knowledge keepers and the value of knowledge keepers over say degrees and diplomas. Um, and I have to credit the ministries, a lot of them are starting to recognize that that's, that's okay, there's, there's, um, there's value to knowledge keepers. So it's trying to uh, embed in the curriculum as much Indigenous content from within the communities as possible. So, so maybe if I can add to that as well, and another way to another perspective. So within the seven members, we have Six Nations, who is comprised of Six Nations. Uh, we have Yoahio is from Akwesasne, who is Mohawk. Oshki, you may have Cree, Oji Cree, and, and all of the members are, are very different nations. So when we develop something through the IIC, it's that base content, and it's based on the community where it's being developed. So when using the tree of, of peace, the white pine, I'm Haudenosaunee and that's why I use that reference. But if we send that over to Oshki and we're sharing it with our members, Oshki can adapt it based on their communities that mandate them and the appropriate culture and traditions that go along with it. And all of our members do that. And that's how we keep the identity, indigenous identity intact. Beautiful. I, th I think you both put it so well. It's recognizing the uniqueness of the third pillar, right, which is each institute and the communities that they serve um, each have your own approaches. So we as a sector, as a community, need to support and uplift that. I am. I do want to read a few comments in the chat on the platform. Uh, someone asked for your contact information. So eCampus is putting that in there. Uh, Noah says, the last slide feels so important. Part of valuing and recognizing skills is identifying the skills that are valued and recognized in the communities we serve. Anything short of that will echo, echo colonization approaches. We also have a question here. Um, we have time. Uh, the person says, great presentation. Can you talk about PLAR, P-L-A-R slash R-P-L practices being used in this context? I vote Sam or Rebecca. <laughs> well, I can just say from Six Nations Polytechnic, we don't actively do PLAR right now, but this is something that we are looking at. For so long, we've worked in partnership with um, colleges and universities. And since 2017 now, we can begin to develop our own programs, what we call our signature programs. And therein we have that, you know, that scope to be able to do the PLAR from our perspective and to take into account the life experiences that might otherwise not be considered in a PLAR process. Yeah. Wonderful. We'll give Sam a second if she wants to unmute. If not, that's okay. We'll go to another question. Um, Can I just add, add something? Oh, Sorry. Please. Yeah, no, please. So it, maybe not in the same vein, but one of the things sort of touching on the capacity issue as well, we've developed something and through the LEAD Institute, Six Nations Polytechnic with, in collaboration with all of our members, professional learning communities. And it's a tremendous, tremendous tool. It, it's a course that we piloted, but when we talk about capacity, having the, the ability to take it to the next step. 
that's where we need more equity and resources to be able to do that. So we've got wonderful tools, tools like that, but to be able to continue them um, forward. So just an example. Absolutely, wonderful. Well, we are at our time mark. Um, I will open the floor one more time for any final thoughts from any of our speakers today. Uh, myself, before we close off, I will throw one link in the chat for our attendees, a wonderful report uh, published on IIC's website. I encourage everyone to head there, read their publications that they do in consultation with their members, of course. Um, but without further ado, thank you so much on behalf of all of our attendees and everyone from eCampus Ontario. Um, there is another session tomorrow with Sam and a colleague. I encourage everyone to come and watch that session as well. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.